Now you know it's gonna be a good time when the trash bag packaging comes out. Now the thing that makes this erring motherboard from AliExpress more exciting than a normal motherboard is that it has a laptop CPU soldered straight to the board, making it a lot less flexible. And on the back it shows some pictures of the heat spreader that covers the laptop die out of modesty, presumably. Now I can't quite remember which of these CPU options I ended up buying, so I guess we'll find that out together later on. Let's open it up. It comes with a very straight cut note with some useful advice on it. And then we also get a SATA cable with a little bit of thermal paste. It's a nice addition. Now the first thing that I noticed is that it didn't come with the CMOS battery. That's a bit weird. I guess I'll just have to steal one from another motherboard. Now aside from the abducted CMOS battery, the most exciting part of this motherboard is the slither of copper in the middle. It's cool that they pre-installed the heat spreader for you, although around the back they did use some hipster triangle head screws for some reason. Either way, it's cool that you don't have to worry about damaging the die, and I'm sure that it also helps with like cooler mounting clearance and stuff. Next up, according to the sticker, we've got an erring 11th core i7 in here, which I'm assuming is the 11800H, a laptop chip that's relatively recent and very powerful. So we should be able to get some gaming out of this chip that won't make our eyes bleed, even with its iGPU, but we'll, we'll find out soon enough. In terms of rear IO, we've got a bunch of video out, which should help for iGPU gaming. Other than that though, it's not looking fancy back here, but it should get the job done. In terms of the power delivery, it looks like the kind of thing used by the ancient Sumerians to power their cattle, but it's a pretty low power draw laptop chip, so it, it should be fine. Next to that, I'm really excited by the fact that despite it being a laptop chip, we have full-size desktop RAM slots, so we don't have to use any loser laptop RAM. Generally, in terms of features, the motherboard's perfectly fine. We've got two M.2 slots, a Wi-Fi card slot, and we even get some front USB 3. Very nice. Anyway, with that, let's build our system and see how she runs some games. Hey, LGA 1200 mounting fits on it. That's good to know. Oh, let me quickly go steal a CMOS battery somewhere and then we'll finish the cooler mounting. works. Now in terms of CPU, apparently it's a genuine Intel CPU 000 at 2.2 gigahertz, which is very convincing. I guess it's because it's an engineering sample that it doesn't have its normal name up. Uh, in terms of memory, oh okay, well it's just running at its base frequency, but we'll check out the BIOS in a second and see if we can do anything about that. It, it just says Intel UHD graphics, that's, that's very useful. <laughs> The BIOS was an intimidatingly retro throwback, with pages upon pages of settings, all written in what I can only imagine to be a language long lost to the annals of history. And after a confusing 20 minutes of drowning in submenus, I concluded there was nothing I could do about the memory speeds. As is tradition, we're starting off with GTA 5, using 1080p normal settings because we've got an iGPU. Wow, this actually isn't running too poorly. Now, it may just be sitting in the 30s, but we're running at the native resolution of this display and it's not triggering my botulism. What's also very promising about this is we're only getting about 11-ish percent CPU utilization, so later on when we throw in a proper graphics card, we may get some serious gaming performance. Also, look at that power draw. Now with CSGO running at competitive settings, we have some jarring stutters. But in the moments of clarity between the stutters, despite the non-show-stopping frame rate, the game feels pretty good. Often with frame rates this low, you can get a lot of input lag in CSGO. And while there's a little bit of it here, it's not that bad. Ah, oh, there we go, like I'm still able to put these bots in their place. 
Okay, now hear me out. Battlefield 5 may be running like an asthmatic in a pollen factory here, but we're using a genuine Intel iGPU and there's some Battlefield 5 happening. So I just can't help but be impressed here. Dropping the resolution to 720p yields a significant performance improvement and it doesn't look that bad. Battlefield 5 wears 720p better than I was expecting. The most exciting thing for me though is that CPU utilization. There's a lot of room to grow. Now I'm gonna be a complete badass and start off Half-Life 2 with all high settings. I know, I know it's madness, but let's see what happens. Nice, my bravery paid off, look at that, hundreds of frames. Anyway, let's drop an unreasonably powerful graphics card in here to really make the CPU wheeze. That is running a little bit better. And I've even cranked the advanced settings to keep us from the stutter zone. So this is peak GTA 5 without mods and stuff and whatever, but yeah, it's running a bit better. And the system looks great. The motherboard kind of reminds me of one of those little fish that clean the mouths of whale sharks. It's pretty wholesome. With Battlefield 5 at 1080p ultra settings, it's running interestingly. We're getting quite wild fluctuations in frame rate, and we've clearly got a CPU bottleneck going on here with quite low GPU utilization. What's pretty crazy about all this for me is that this is ultra settings and we're getting 150 frames per second, but the graphics card's only being used like 50%. It's <laughs> It's like, oh, look at this CPU bottleneck. We're only getting 170 frames per second. What an outrage. To be fair, when things get busier, the frame rate does drop to only about 100. With Cyberpunk at 1080p Ultra settings, we're seeing a similar trend to Battlefield 5, where the CPU is worth about half the power of the RTX 4070 Ti that we're using. It is holding the GPU back, but it's a very powerful GPU, and it's doing an admirable job in my opinion. I think there's just one thing left to do. I want to remove that cold plate so we can get some bareback action between the CPU cooler and the silicon die to see what that does for our temperatures. I'm gonna be very careful about evenly relieving pressure here because I don't want to accidentally murder a CPU die. Oh, I think it just fell. There is our contact plate and as you can see they just use a thermal paste application that makes contact with the laptop die down there. Now seeing the height of this plate, I'm actually not sure we're gonna be able to normally mount that cooler. I don't think it's gonna touch the die, but we'll give it a try in a second. And then that obelisk is our 11th gen laptop CPU, which is so tiny. Let's give it a clean and have a closer look. And that shiny bit of silicon with the gold letters next to it is our genuine Intel CPU. Wow, that's not even almost touching. I guess we're gonna have to get a bit more ratchet with it. A few moments later. So I guess now we're gonna have to mega raw dog it because we don't even have mounting hardware for the CPU cooler. What I'm gonna do is just kind of gently place the cooler down. That feels reasonable. Let's turn it on and see what happens. Wow, okay. So all you need to do to knock a couple of degrees off of your genuine Intel CPU is remove the contact plate and then precariously lean your cooler on it. It sounds like useful information to end the video on.